first speaker, um, while well, I was on staff with the Unitarian Universalist Association's Washington office for advocacy in D.C., and when we heard about this horrendous legislation that was proposed in the Ugandan legislature, of course, our, our thought is always first, well, well what, what do people in our Unitarian Universalist congregations on the ground? And so we turned to the EU Church of Kampala, Uganda, and that got the association in relationship with this gentleman over here. And it has been such an amazing experience get to know a little bit of, of Reverend Martin's story and the story of the Kampala Church, and to hear about people who are really on putting themselves in harm's way day after day, simply to stand up for the rights of all people, for the human speak for about 45 minutes, and then, um, God willing, we will have a little bit of a documentary uh, that he has brought with us, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers, so, and that's the format. And then we have a lovely reception plan with cake and beverages, and we hope you will stay and join us for that as well. So I'm waiting for him. Is that okay? So why don't you stand up, then we say a word of prayer, a prayer of wisdom, then we start. Only if you can stand. If you, you are free to say no, and uh, there will be no problem. I will not call the police. Okay. Come at Kweba Zoro Kubanga to Zewana Kaunges Korwarero. Rich Sacho Tua Dena Amanyi Gonovu Yinzo Kubanti Tukunganye Iriaba Antwabe Njauro Abamunga Veru Abalangabadu gavu, abalangabadu demu sine mbitundu ya vienjaulu. Na hefe nanga tulio mtu wa umu. I pray for wisdom, love, reconciliation, understanding, and peace. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. So you may be seated. So, um, I'm so much grateful as well to be able to stand here this evening. Um, to be a testimony of my ministry in Uganda and at the same time um, of myself uh, and everything that uh, um, I'll be able to speak on. Um, when I met with uh, Ken uh, about three months ago or two, uh, when did we meet? In June, the start of June. So you can say June, July, August. Um, we had breakfast and later we had lunch and then later I met them within their fraternity 
So we had to debate and begin a few issues, but amongst them, we agreed that I should be able to come here to, to the German town. In spite of the fact that he knew very well that there are no Germans here, he <laughs> insists that this is a German town. So maybe we'll be able to do something about that also. Uh, so I agreed, and I was very much looking forward to find Germans, but everybody speaks English, and I say, maybe it's, we name it English town. But uh, nevertheless, I was very obedient enough, and I'm here. So is that okay? Good. Maybe I thought you would say, why are you here then? So I'll begin by letting you know my name is Reverend Mark Kimba, and I come from Uganda. So if you know where Uganda, if you know where Africa is, that's also Uganda, and that's me. Sometimes when people see me and they see I am black, they think I'm from the Caribbean or somewhere else. I'm from Uganda. I think it's good when you read the book when you know the title and the author, isn't it? So that's why I tell you all that. It's very exciting that amidst there is someone from my country, and uh, she's here. Abali zenyu tunalisema ni kiswahiri mungu mufalume. <laughs> so we could be able to speak another language. That is a testimony that actually humanity is so rich. You can never compromise it in one way. But we remain the same. So uh, she's here also to be able to listen to me. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. To begin with is that uh, I'll tell you the ministry that actually encourages me in my country, and at the same time, I'll be able to share a little bit of Africa um, on African continent, especially the African politics, um, so much particularizing it with Uganda. Because I realize also that uh, sometimes, because we don't have a wider knowledge or view of uh, an issue in a, such a context, is that's why at some point we defer to reach on an answer. So many, um, Africa is a large continent. And when sometimes people see me, they say, oh, you are from Africa. And they begin by asking me of a country even where I've never been. Because sometimes they think it's Africa is one country. So Africa is a large continent, comprising more than 53 uh, states, of which Uganda is. But being that it's on the same continent, um, Uganda has experienced more or less the same like other African countries. Um, for example, Africa was so much colonized either by the British, the German, uh, the Belgian, and some of the France. I don't know where the Americans were to do some colonization. You know. Um, so that's how uh, actually Uganda is. For us in Uganda, we attained independence in 1962, October the 9th. And that's when we ask the Queen of England, and she's there at that base, and we say, can you pack up your bags, pants and everything, and go? And then she was very obedient, and then she went. But, but there are some questions up to this time that still remains uh, on all most of African continent, uh, countries on the continent. And we say, was it really the right time for us to have independence and to ask the colonials to be able to go? You will say, why am I asking that question, and which I'm not going to answer, um, which maybe at some point will be able to answer for me, is because of the so many things that are coming up. For example, in Uganda, 50, almost 50 years, it will be 50 years next year that we have had independence. But when you actually look on the ground in terms of uh, economical development, social development, and the political, it's almost nothing has ever happened. Economically, by the time the British left my country in October 1962, the British pound was equal to the Ugandan currency, the shilling. So it required you one shilling to have a pound. Today, you require 4,000 and 500 Ugandan shillings to just buy one pound. You, you understand? And when you want to buy a dollar of, uh, of the US, it requires you 2,800 shillings just to buy one dollar. 
um, that's one in terms of economy. So things so much went on um, infiltrating that you can either believe if these are the same economies that once lived in the same uh, category. When you look at the side of the politics also, um, the same thing in my country is not different from Zimbabwe because in Zimbabwe to buy a dollar, it may require you something like a, a, million, a million Zimbabwean kwacha to be able to buy just one dollar. In fact, because of the inflation, now they are using a US dollar in that country of Zimbabwe. Everything collapsed. Um, when you look on the side of the politics um, and the way the people are being uh, um, read politically. For us, in spite of the fact that we have, we have a president there and we have periodical elections, the president that is there has been in power for the last 26 years. Um, and there is no much hope anyway that he, he will be able to live either today or tomorrow because we can always have elections and then we do periodically. That's every after five years. So such things, you find them in Zimbabwe. The president has been there since 1980. He's Mugabe. He's 87 years. He's so much tired and retired, but he's still there. Yes, sometimes you may be tired, but not yet retired. But he's both. He's tired and retired, but he still clings on. Uh, we have just seen uh, uh, Libyan Muammar Gaddafi just being wiped out, being there for the last 42 years demonizing people beyond expectation. Uh, that is in same in Egypt. The president has been, was there for 30 years plus. So that's is not something very different from Africa and other countries have not been able to mention. However, there are some countries that have been able to do some progress. The reason why I talk about the African polity is that in most cases, human rights of people are always so much encouraged when the political level is well grounded. You understand what I'm saying? So, but when you go to countries like South Africa, they always have changes of leadership. They have periodic elections. There are other countries like Ghana. Um, we have another country neighboring us, Tanzania, uh, Kenya. They are on the progress. They're doing some good achievement in terms of polit politics. There are some other countries like Rwanda, Burundi trying to be able to come up and uh, we only pray and say, let the will be done. But in spite of all that, when you look at the time when the British had to leave our country and then they go and up to this time, so much has changed among us themselves. The values of the people, the economy, the social factors, the issue of human rights, it's all on the fast track. And then we say, where are we and why did we have to pursue this goal? My mother, who is 74 years, she tells me that by the time of the British being in Uganda then, all the infrastructures were okay. We were having hospitals, we were having schools. In terms of social services was beyond service. So thereby, you say today, it's very possible to go to a, any referral hospital and she can be a testimony and you don't find anything. And you say, do we have any government? And then you are able to go to this, like in the country, my country in Uganda now, the university lecturers are striking, the, all the primary teachers are on the strike, almost everything is out of mess. But then somebody says he's able to be able to do that. I don't involve myself into the politics in my country, which is elective and active participation, because that's, none of, that's not so much of my calling. But I'm able to make a fall so that I can be able to tell people, especially in my church, and those ones I reach out, what is it? But the, so many things are almost, to this moment, are out of control in most of African countries. That you ask yourself, was it the right time for us to ask it and be able to attain independence. What I mean, just like a child, he says, I'm gonna leave my mother and my father's house to go, but are you ready to be on your own? If so, that's fine. You say, 
it's okay, then you'll be able to live. So when you look on those kind of trends of um, the politics, uh, the social sector, and the economy, you really find out that a lot has to be done. And now, this is what brings me into saying, what is the role of the church that has to, be, has to do to help the community, especially on the social sector? This is issues concerning with healthy, um, education, and things like that. Uganda is not so different from other African countries in terms of uh, social services when you talk about health. We are one of the countries that was worse affected with the issue of virus, of the virus that causes AIDS. It was in the 80s that AIDS was first discovered in my town, where I come from, Masaka. In the whole of Uganda, AIDS was first discovered at home, where I grew up. Um, and the almost no family within uh, the geographical area of about 10 millions that no one didn't test the issue of AIDS. For example, I was born in a family of 10, and I'm the last born. But up to today, as I speak, I only have two sisters and two brothers. You can ask yourself where the balance of the siblings. They passed away because of HIV and AIDS. That is, it has been a very big issue in my country, and we had a, one of the most activists on AIDS issue, that's the president we have. He stood beyond expectation and campaigned strongly to make sure that the people get to know the issue of AIDS. And he tried until somewhere in the start of 2000. That's where the battle started to fail. And how did it fail? At that time, the people of America erected a president and was called George W. Bush. Do you remember him? You know him? Okay, I didn't know. Sometimes I don't know. So you can remind me. So, but anyway, when he was elected, um, every government that comes to power always has policies. Uganda was having an issue of many people dying of AIDS. And they saw other African countries and other third world as well. So he introduced the a fund that was called the PEFA, the Presidential Emergence AIDS Relief Fund. And it was only sanctuated to do one big job, to make sure that the people infected with AIDS can get medicine. In Uganda, we call it ARVs. It was a good job. It, the money did a good job because never before that people were able to go to hospital and be able to register and have this free medicine without paying any money. Because before then it was available but very expensive. That almost see no many Ugandans out of 10, maybe one or two could afford it. However, when we, what we saw with that money was also another negative aspect of it that when the fund was released to Uganda, it was had another attachment. The, we were trying to fight AIDS by using this method, ABC. Can you say ABC? ABC. Good, you know English, I didn't know. So A st stood for abstinence, and the B stood for being faithful, if you, are, you have a partner. And then C meant if you, you don't abstain and you are not faithful, you do what? You use a condom. When the bush came in and he see uh, many, many people, he, he said the fund is there, but you only have to preach abstainers and being faithful. Um, so we started to see a problem. Because we had to preach abstainers, I believe abstinence is 100% the best method to combat STD. Because it's almost 100%. You can't get it because you abstain. And being faithful is very okay. But many people are human beings. Sometimes they can be unfaithful to others. That's why the medical people said if you cannot abstain, 
and you can't be faithful, then you use a what? A candle. So AIDS was almost defeated. And that method was so much campaigned by the president because he got international attention for that courage. But because we are a poor country, we had to succumb to Bush's authority and the policies. Many people, especially the church and in some other organization, they stopped preaching about, against, about the use of condom. Actually, they went against the condom use. And the prevailing rate of AIDS in Uganda went high. I am so happy and grateful that uh, Again, the people of America said, okay, Bush, thank you so much for being in the White House for eight years. Now we want to bring in someone else. Because when you brought in that person, I don't know his name. What is his name? Okay, okay, his name Obama, yes. Okay. I'll, be, I'll repeat that, Obama. Is that okay? Okay. The policies then changed. That now we freely, as a church and other government uh, institutions, are able to preach and what I mean is to be able to educate people by telling them to be able to use the condoms. I'll tell you one thing. Abstinence works, and being faithful works. But you know very well that in most cases, people are able to abstain during the day. But when the night comes, I don't know. But you can educate me. I'm here to learn. So I always remain and say, now we can, some people can't abstain. And at the same time, if they can't be faithful, what is going to happen? you're going to get STDs or AIDS. And that kind of message went across because Africa and most of those countries, they are poor. Really, they need always support from other countries of which they dictate to them the policies. So that is where we have been on the issues of health. So our church, what has been its role and responsibility on the issue of politics, social factors, and the economy? Because we have to be obliged to the policies of our government, there is little we can be able to change. Only we can make noise. And if we are hard and we say, be blessed. My church, which started in 2004, um, has been so much involved in issues of social action and responsibility. We have a school which we started with as an uh, action program uh, within the community that we are sponsoring uh, 550 children. And these children are the ones who lost their parents due to HIV and AIDS. They don't have AIDS, but they lost their parents. And at the same time, our, our church sponsors an orphanage home of 23 children. These children, they look to be, you can say 23, but they have a problem. Uh, they were born with the virus that causes AIDS. So we had to bring them in and uh, try as much as possible to do and make sure we give them care. So we've been doing that since 2004. And we have been a very, very, very happy family of our church that we do something within the community. Many people came to the line of knowing our church um, maybe two years ago, if not even not, maybe about one year. But we were existing since then. You knew that? Yeah, not before. So because normally uh, so we were just of ourselves and doing the ministry because that was not much more than spiritual spirituality, uh, to bring a more spiritual edification and exhortation among ourselves. Um, so that's when people got to know so much of us. But our church was always existing. And uh, it was the only church up to this time, I, I'm, I, I haven't seen another church, that was started actually on the foundation of uh, acceptance, reconciliation, and love. Not many churches in Uganda are under that auspice. Although they may be able to preach love, reconciliation, and acceptance of one another, at the same time, you find it becoming a bit exclusive. They want to extend love to the way people, to the only group of people they want, but not universal. Are you okay? You seem to be quiet. What can we do? 
Is there somebody? I think we can have the reception maybe in 10 minutes. So we can have some wine and then be able to lift it up. Eh? Well, um, that is what the composition of our church um, has been doing. But anyway, before then, uh, about myself, as I said, I will give a testimony of myself and at the same time of the church. Myself, I didn't start as a Unitarian minister. Before then, I was an evangelical preacher. And I did a good job, you can imagine. <laughs> hey, hey, I tell you, I wish you came then. I went to the Bible college in, two, in 1998. I was asked by my pastor if I could go and join the Bible college for the purpose of going to the ministry. And I accepted very well because I wanted to get more involved. But before then, I went to school and I was I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering. Yes, tell me anything to do with electrical, I come in. No charges, I don't, give, I don't send vouchers. I'll be able to do that for free. So I finished all that and I left it there because the church wanted me to do something within the ministry. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go to the Bible college. I trained and then came back. And I remember one thing that my pastor did was to ask me if possible to accept to be licensed um, to take up the associate pastorship. My pastor was a, an American um, missionary in Uganda, and I belonged to the United Apostolic Church of Uganda. So we did a good job. One man is black, another one is white. So it was good. However, my church was very conservative. Do you know the word conservative? Okay, if you don't know, you go to the Oxford Dictionary. You check it. You will find what it means. But before you go, I'll be able to explain what it means within the church. And some of you, you were there. I hope so. So our church was very, very, very much vocal then about women issues. That they only wanted to see women as a, maybe I can say nothing so much in the church. But our church was big in terms of numbers that we are 250 plus. And 75% of those people were women. But the women were not allowed to do much in the church. One thing, a woman is not allowed to cut over hair. So those are the ch that's the church I served. Have you ever known about it? Doesn't allow a woman to cut the hair because it is disgraceful. A woman in the church I served, you couldn't come to the church just the way you put on. They say you have to put up to the board to the, of your nails. You can't put on jewel, neither to have open um, hands, clothes. No. It's all that disgraceful. I didn't know so much of the doctrine of this church until I went on digging and I said, mm -mm, I don't think this is for me. But I'm going to be here until I can't be here. And that's what I did. So I was there for about five and a half years. But before then, I wanted to see some liberty coming to those people. And I asked the pastor one other time, even though the women are not allowed, according to the Bible, can we be ourselves and allow them to do something? Because they're just human beings, just like anyone else. Because for me, I was convicted, beyond no reasonable doubt, that a woman is the same as a man in all aspects. I was raised up by a woman, just single like this, and we are 10. So I knew that a woman can do much more than what even a man can be able to do. Women, why don't you clap for yourselves for that? Hey, look at them. I knew that, totally, that they can be able to do more and that. But the pastor said no. One, when we had a meeting with the board, I also brought it up. They said, no, it doesn't work here. The Bible says if a woman does not understand or has intended to do anything at the church, let her wait when they go back home and she asks the husband. And I told them, what about those ones who are not married? Who will they be able to ask? They didn't have an answer. So also, issues started to be very different. For example, our church is within the city, was within the city center. And it was called the, um, the United Apostolic Church of Uganda. So we had our headquarters there. 
So as a city, it was so much under the auspice of cosmopolitan, all people from different backgrounds. And she knows. We have all the tribes, 53 tribes in Uganda. Everybody speaks a different language and all different behaviors in terms of cultural differences. So I realized that when we don't allow women, at the same time, the church may wake up one day and say, this tribe shouldn't come to the church because it starts slowly by slowly. Uh, but they said no. Um, okay, I said fine. But before I left the church also, we were, I started to have these issues. I remember I recorded 11 of my counseling uh, uh, data when I was still serving uh, the United Apostolic Church. That I started to have people calling in and coming in at the same time inquiring on issues concerning sex and sexuality as related to the Bible. And one of the first men that called me, he wanted to know how do I interpret the Bible and the issue of homosexuality. And I remember I answered him and I say, that's a sin, it is unacceptable, it, you must have a problem, either you are demon possessed, so you have to come here, I pray for you, and I chase away the demons. Okay? That was one case, and I recorded because we are required to record and give the details. So it didn't take long that I also got another person who walked in after fixing an appointment that he wanted to see a pastor, and he was told to come and see me. And this girl said she just wanted to know also more about what the Bible teaches. The reason is, one, Ugandan people are so much religious. And in that context of religion, there are so much Christians in them. So they always want everything to relate within their Christianity or their faith. Um, and I told her, biblically, we had time to bargain the Bible because that's what I believed. And that's what I knew. Um, that the Bible teaches this and this and this and all that. She graciously walked and then went. So it took me about a period of three years that within my counseling and information, I had encountered 11 cases of people inquiring about issues of sex and sexuality, especially as it regards to homosexuality. You hear me? Okay, if you hear me, raise up your hand like this. Good. Yeah, because we, we are going for reception, don't worry. We will receive everyone. And then I said, okay. Then I went to the board. To the, we always had our meetings. And I introduced some of these cases that I found out from different people inquiring. And I asked them, what should we do? And then the church leadership told me, that doesn't work. You know how the Bible um, tells about issues of sex and sexuality, especially on uh, homosexuality? If such a man or a woman wants to come to the church, not only this one, but to any other church, he has to denounce that form of sexuality. I did some research, and I went to the university. I wanted to find out exactly. Now it has become an issue, and I wanted to know by myself. I remember having to go to the University of Makerere, and I went to one other Catholic priest who told me that he knows, he was in London and trying, that he knows that they are gay people, um, but the, he has nothing much he can do, especially in Uganda, where homosexuality is a crime. So he advised me that there's nothing I can do, but all I wanted from him is a confirmation of whether homosexuality exists. Because I thought it's something supernatural or somewhere in the air. But he, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to know, because he was so much uh, a, a, a priest in the ministry, so he was able to tell me he has been able to understand, he knows, but the doctrine he follows in the church does not allow, but it's entirely up to me. I said, that's fine. So when I went back, I asked the church what we can do on issues of concerning sex and sexuality, especially as it leads to homosexuality. Um, there was no open door, even a willingness. And what I did was to leave the church. And then I went, and um, 
did nothing. I just wanted to go back to the university and do some other studies. Because I wanted to see women first being allowed to do ministry, just like me. And at the same time, I had come to realize that uh, if I want to serve a church, it should be a church of all people. But I can't do it within where I was. So the only thing was one, to leave. So I went, I was trying to do some further studies. And then uh, at the university also, I realized that there were questions that didn't have answers. And it wasn't so much also on sexuality as well, but on several, several issues. The way the church is so much, um, you know, on creed and so much conservative, no kind of progressiveness. So I realized, okay, maybe this is the church I had to do. Or there are also other people who want to have some freedom and openness. I didn't know that what was I, I was going through is what we call Unitarianism. But then finally, I found my way. So there's no regret whatsoever. So how did that happen? So when I was at the university, I realized that I had still the calling to do ministry. Still, because five years and a half, it wasn't for nothing. So I finally went and we started a church, which we had a name, New Life Community Church. And the intention was one beginning was to preach a new life. That no matter what happens, there is always something new. And uh, we wanted to use the word community because I was already convinced that the community is always big. There are always people from all different walks of life. So that's what uh, I was able to, I was trying to do. I didn't know much. That's, that's why it takes me. But I'm, most importantly, I still thought that I'm going to be more liberal within my Christian values and things like that. So, however, starting the church, then I said, where am I going to be? Who, where can I be affiliated, people to work with? I can't be a Catholic? No, because I don't want this anymore. <laughs> yes, I was there with my mother. She took me to a Catholic church all the days. And I said, no more of that. So I said, okay, uh, to be evangelical, I don't want to be affiliated with any evangelical denomination because... I don't want to tell people everything what to do. Don't drink, don't do this. Don't do this and that. No. So I want to see which one. And I said, I don't know. In me, the word God was very strong. So I said, okay. I went back in my notes at the Bible college. And I said, okay. We studied about many religions. But I remember, because at the, at the Bible college, we had a course called World Religions where we study everything concerning the region and the sects and denominations. So we had studied about Unitarian Universalists. I mean, you, we studied about you in Germany town, although you were an American. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> you still convinced this is German town? <laughs> okay. So I said, okay, let me find out what is Unitarianism and Universalist. This is what we had studied about Unitarians, that Unitarians... No, that is a false hilarity, false teaching, false religion. Hilarity? Yeah, heresy. I can never say that. Hilarity. Yeah, church, what? Heretics. Yeah, church questioning. So, and that is, the Unitarians, some believe in God, others believe in nothing. Others are atheist, others are agnostics. So I said, okay, let me go back and find out these people. But there was nothing. It was just not to learn about a denomination. You understand that? So, oh, how am I going to find that? Because there was a concept that I wanted. Then I went to the American Information Service Center. Already I was a member of that. It's a kind of a library, but it's a resource center with so many information. When I arrived there, I asked the lady at the bar, at the counter, if she can find me a book or an information about world religions. This is very important because this is my journey. And it's a good journey, not any other journeys you have ever traveled. No, this is not going to Iraq, Afghanistan, no. This is a real journey, a journey of liberty. Can you say liberty? Because my journey is liberating so many people as, long, as well as myself. So she told me, okay, but what do you want exactly? 
And I told her I want to find about Unitarian Universalist. So she was very interesting and understanding. She went to the shelves and she found me the word encyclopedia on world religions. Huge like this. And she already opened where that is. So she told me to read through that. And I started reading. But what I remember this lady did to me, she, went, she stayed there and found another information on her computer. I, by then, I didn't know how to use the internet and things like that. But while st still seated on my table, she brought another bunch of papers on issues of uh, Unitarian, Universalist, and I say, hey, woo, this is it. So what I did, I read through, and I put it over there. So I worked with the notes. When I was home, I started to read more. It was very interesting because it was so diverse. The diverse was that uh, I found all people. From whatever faith, everybody was there. Christians, Jewish, uh, even I saw Rastafarians in the Unitarians. Did you know that? Oh, she's saying yes. So I said, okay, this is it. And I initiated the contact slowly by slowly um, to UUA and see if we can get in touch. It didn't materialize until after such a time. I want to be short about that, but finally I found the, the Unitarian Universalist to be one of the nicest people on this earth. They welcomed me, they were very good, and that is the doctrine. By the way, the only message we can preach in these last days, in the 21st century, you can only preach the doctrine, the teaching, the gospel, the writings of the many Unitarians who have existed. Because many of them have preached about love, reconciliation, affirmation, and peace. And that's what we need in this earth. What you find in our church is this. You will find all people from different walks of life. We have black and white people. We have rich and poor people. We have short people and tall people. We have a thin and all the people who are fat and big. Whatever you mention it, all people are there. We added on also a very strong message then that our church is very open to all people from different sexual orientation. So if you are transgender and you want to be trans, please come to us. You have a space there. If you're a gay man or a woman, you graciously welcome to come to our church. Isn't that good? Why don't you say like this? Next time, next time, we will begin with the reception so we can have some wine. So that is the composition of our church. And if you find your way in Uganda, I suppose that you'll always, <laughs> you'll always find a place in our church. Why are we that? And what is the testimony of our truthfulness? I told you that uh, we've been doing social action programs on children it was until actually last year, if not 2009, that our church also faced another task to see that we advance on our issues of social liberty and social action, and very strongly and very aggressively. Because I myself and the members down there, we are already convinced beyond no reasonable doubt that all men and women are equal on this earth. Whether in the bar, or whether in the church, or whether in what form of social setting all people are the same. I remember I was in London and I was invited by the British Humanist Association to give a lecture about our faith and uh, I received an email from Eric Chair in Boston and he told me, Mark, do you know about this in Uganda? He knew that I was out of the country. And I told him, what is it? He had made an attachment of the anti-homosexuality bill to the email. And I said, what is it? I read it through. And I said, in Uganda? We have been two days? <laughs> no. Um, and I read it through. And I told him, I have no idea. I'm out of the country. But let me try to read and understand. Maybe I'll be able to do something. So quickly, I read it through. And then I said, I don't know. Let me wait when I get back home. I'll try to see what I can do. Um, 
that was the introduction of the anti-homosexuality bell. You know, anti-homosexuality, to stop homosexuality. How can you stop homosexuality? Are there some homosexuals here? Okay. Can you tell me, how do you stop homosexuality? Because, yes, the bill was anti-homosexuality. So I said, okay, maybe they can stop it. And uh, I read through, and I saw all this, and I said, this is too ugly. It is unacceptable, and we don't need it. But how are we going to stop this bill? I, want, I would be very quick to you that uh, this bill, which was in the Ugandan parliament um, at that time, was introduced and actually it came to the floor of parliament for the first reading. That means it, it's going back to the legal committee, and once sanctuated, it, it gets passed. And the only intention was, one, to make sure that they criminalize homosexuality, homosexuals. But I will be able to tell you a bit of what was in the bill, which really got to our mind and to our strength, and we say we need to do something. The bill if required in one of the clauses. Okay? Tell her to listen. Are you listening? Good. The bill required if your parents, you and her, and you have a son, you have a daughter, and you realize that he or she is gay, you are supposed to require you are supposed to return to turn him or her in to the police within twenty four hours. Do we have parents here? Do like this if you're a parent. Because we want to be practical in, our, in what we do. So that was to the parents. And if you don't turn him or her into the police within 24 hours, once convicted in court, you are liable to sentence not less than seven years. Not because you're a criminal, just because of your sexuality. <laughs> so, and then another clause in the bill was stating like this, that whatever you do to support the homosexuals was illegal. And they used the word whatever. Or whether it's the heresy, or whether it is spirituality, or whether you're a lawyer, it is illegal. So do you see where I come in as a spiritual leader? So I wasn't spared. And I said, okay, but I'm supposed to help them. And I don't think that becomes a, a, a crime. Then another clause in the bill was termed the aggravated homosexuality. Aggravated was if you are a gay woman and you rape. That was termed as aggravated. And if you are a gay man and you sleep with a minor, that was termed aggravated homosexuality. And if you sleep and you infect someone with a, a disease or a virus that is leading to death, for example, AIDS, all of that was termed as aggravated homosexuality. And the penalty was death sentence. Is that okay? It's not okay. I wouldn't have any problem with the calling it aggravated when you rap. I would agree. I wouldn't have any problem calling it aggravated if you sleep with a minor. I don't like somebody sleeping with minors because you need to wait for them to grow up so they're able to say something. Eh? I wouldn't have any problem with somebody sleeping and infect someone with AIDS. But the problem is one. I told you about AIDS before. That's why I mentioned it. And that's why I bring it. It's coming now. In Uganda, AIDS was there since... 1980. But there has never been a law saying that if you sleep and you infect somebody with AIDS intentionally, that is aggravated. You understand? But to a homosexual, that is aggravated. You get the point? And I say, no, this is unacceptable. Many people rape, even when you read in the news in Uganda. They are, the highest criminal cases in my country are the rape cases and the people sleeping with minor defilement. But there has never been a, a law all terming that to be aggravated. But to a homosexual sleeping with a minor or raping, that is aggravated. Why? And then I said, they're going to bring this law this time to the gay people 
but next time they are going to bring it to someone else. You get the point. So at this church we said, we need to do something. Surprisingly, this ugly bill, I use the word ugly, it wasn't started, written, doctored, and sponsored by the people of Uganda. They were actually your cousins and daughters of this country, the American evangelical pastors. And they call in their very beautiful group, the family. She is there. We don't have, we never had such a big problems on issues of uh, making the laws against each other. Even from the colonial times. Even though we had our tribal differences, but it, it wasn't so much uh, bringing into contact or everyone becoming an enemy of another. Because when they said that whatever you do to help the community is illegal, it meant if you were a teacher at a school and you don't turn in a, a gay person, so you were supposed to watch at school. <laughs> so if you were, uh, uh, let's say, a nurse or a doctor, you even forget that somebody has come into your clinic when he's sick and pain, and you only call the police. So everybody was put to watch one another. And then we said, as a church, we need to do something. Actually, that's when we, we had to go and convene a conference. Um, we were able to successfully bring about over 200 gay men and women in that conference. We called the Standing on the Side of Love for the first time in Uganda. And our campaign was to make sure we stop this anti-homosexuality bill. <laughs> we, we had a very big campaign. We campaigned very successfully. Um, I remember it was very strong for me. I couldn't take it by myself. I asked my, one of the colleagues in a, a work with and is uh, one of our partner churches in a Tulsa, Reverend Martin, to come to Uganda. He had to risk his life to come over and a, another lady also came from the UN office to support me because I said as myself and a few people, we are convinced we need to stop this bill. Because some of the people who wanted to be criminalized were human beings who have blood, who needed to live the life of, their, of what they were born with. It's not a choice even. That is what they are. So we had to do something. And um, we succeeded. That bill wasn't passed in the Ugandan parliament, although they are threatened to bring it back. But we also say, will we be able to do something? Um, but before I finish up, I want to bring you a testimony of actually how the issue of anti homosexuality. Um, st was stewed up in Uganda when those people went over there. I'm going to ask my fellow minister to show you a, a documentary uh, in the next few minutes, see, which will show you how extreme it went. Is that okay? Then you watch, man. <laughs> 